So hi everyone, I'm Catherine Kelly, I'm a partner at Keith Parry, I'm head of retail and I'm one of our resident nerds who does a lot of the financial reporting and uh, accounting updates. And Danny's giving me the graveyard stock today, so I know you wait for lunch and it's technical update time, but come on, we're on the home straight, mm -hmm. so we'll get there. And there's quite a lot actually to talk to you about today in financial reporting, that's quite interesting. I'm playing fast and loose with the word interesting, but there's a lot <laughs> going on. Uh, firstly, Fred 82, so this is the changes to UK GAP, changes to um, FS 102, we'll talk about that in quite a lot of detail. We'll skim over amendments to FS 100, <laughs> that's only relevant if you're a group, part of the overseas group, so we'll canter through that very quickly. We've then got the Financial Reporting Council's review of accounts, so basically what everyone's doing wrong, so we'll talk around that quickly. And then lastly, it's Economic Crime Bill, which sounds a bit line of duty. Sadly, it's Companies House Reform, so <coughs> get excited for that at the end. So firstly, FRED82, so a bit of a background on this, but those of you who are a bit rusty, in the UK, we have International Financial Reporting Standards, which are the gold standard, they are my favourite, most people hate them. Um, that's the ones that the biggest, largest companies adopt. And then we also have a UK GAP, which is the simplified FRS 102 version that most of you will follow. And following on from what Adele said earlier, actually, you know, we've heard a lot in the past about simplification, about reducing bureaucracy. This is not that. This is not what's coming now. So FRS 102 was a huge simplification when it came in. It's about 400 pages long. But we always knew that over time it would start to converge with IFRS. And this is the first big convergence. So FRED, which is quite a catchy title, it's Financial Reporting Exposure Draft 82, um, is 350 pages long just for the changes. So you see how FRS 102 is evolving into a much more detailed beast. It says they're proposed, and that's underlined. Don't get excited that that means it's going away. It's not. It just means the small print might change. So you can still comment and uh, FRC, you know, get your strongly worded letter in when you hear about what's going to change. Uh, but really, we know what's coming and we know the substance of it. The time frame for it is effective for accounting periods on or after 1st of January, so a December 25 year end. So again, you might be thinking, why are we talking about this now? I've got ages. If you've got a lot of leases, you need ages. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So yeah, don't want to underplay how big this is for some businesses. So the two changes that are coming, and if you already are IFRS adopters, you're probably sitting here, I think Nick said you were sitting here pretty small than life, but this is already done for you. But revenue is a big one. So the fundamental principles of how we recognise revenue will be changing to follow the IFRS model, which we'll go into. It is simplified, but it depends on your industry. It could have a huge impact. So as I say, I mainly work with retailers. For them, there's not really any change because you buy it, you sell it. You might need to think about loyalty cards or discounts or uh, rebates, but generally revenue recognition is same before and after. But if you are um, an IT company and you sell hardware and SaaS and support and maintenance, <coughs> you will have a huge impact. So it really depends on the nature of the business. And some of the companies I worked with, I did an IPO transition um, to IFRS, they had to change their whole operational business model of how they record contracts, how they administer what they do, how they record, because this really changed how they reported and they needed to get the systems to back that up. So it depends is the small print on that one. Leasing is easier. And I hold my hands up, this is my favourite standard. I mean, I don't know if many other people have a favourite standard, it's just me, but I could geek out about this all day. Um, I won't, don't worry. Uh, but I run a forum with Halfords, the Halfords Finance Forum, and for two or three years, we only talked about this. That's how big it was. And one of the grocers that I act for, the leasing standard added seven billion in liabilities to its balance sheet. It could be huge if you have a lot of leases. So it's, uh, yeah, it depends on how many properties and all of that you have, but it's very complex. It's not a nice standard. It's greatly simplified, but it's still quite complex. <coughs> and again, to give you a flavour, the open FS 102 today, there is, I think, 20 paragraphs on leasing. After Fred 82, there'll be 160. So a big impact from that one. 
There's also some other changes just to run through. So section 1A, so if you are a small company and you adopt the reduced disclosure, a lot of that encouraged disclosures are now mandatory. Um, I'm not great because I would have to big companies mainly of what those encouraged disclosures are, but I think going concern is one. I think there's one about statement compliance. <laughs> I think there might be one about related parties, but there's a few standards that are encouraged and they're now saying no, get them in there. The concepts and principles, fair values, those two, basically it's changing the words that are in FRS 102 and replacing them with the words that are in IFRS. So as I say, it's part of the convergence towards IFRS. <coughs> so substantially there's no difference to what you're doing now, but there's a lot more guidance, a lot more chat about it, some new terminology. Uh, financial instruments, so currently in FRS 102 you can adopt the simplified FRS 102, you can adopt IFRS 9 or you can adopt IS 39. Um, it's saying basically they're going to start taking away the option to adopt IS 39. Again, this is quite niche and ugh, financial instruments, let's not go into that. But yeah, it's taking away the options of what you can do going forwards to push you down the full IFRS route. Going concern, this is the one where we're going to need to always say something. So I think down look at we mostly do now don't we in the climate we're in but it is kind of optional it's encouraged but this is now saying you know you will always need that going concern paragraph in your accounting policies of what the director's assessment is and how they've made it and then finally some niche guidance <coughs> on business combinations accounting for contingent consideration if you've got influence very niche so there are the other changes coming in but this is for me this is the big stuff so revenue. So what revenue does is move to the IFRS five-step model, which is not rocket science, it's quite intuitive, but it's quite different to the UK GAP model because we're moving away from risks and rewards and all of that to something that's based on the transfer of control and it's based on performance obligation and promises and fair value. So first part of it is identify your contract. I mean, that's pretty obvious. You've got a contract with a customer, an agreement with them. There's not too much complication in that. The second bit is identify the promises or the performance obligations. And these can be explicit in the contract or implied. This is basically what you're gonna do for the money. So I'm gonna give you some support, a license, maybe some installation. It's all of that, like what are you promising to do? And that can be, again, fairly simple, but the complexity is are these distinct promises or are they bundled? Like can someone only benefit from one if they get the other? So you have to look at your business model and start to work out like what do we actually do for our customers? What are the different obligations? Because then that leads to the next part. Again, if you're a retailer, easy. I'd give you something and you take it home. But if you are some construction company or I've got one that's a clinical drugs company, um, it can get really fiddly. Next is transaction price. So again, well, I know what I'm gonna get, that's easy enough. Maybe not, what if you have volume discounts and kickers and rebates. If you buy 10,000, it's this price, but if you go into 20,000, it's that price. What if they pay early and get a settlement discount? What if there's consideration, what at the end, you know, if you can sell or return, consignment stock, send some back. So under UK GAP, there's a bit of a tendency to, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Under IFRS, no, you have to make a reasonable assumption at the start of what money you're gonna get at the end. So you have to start to make estimates of your total transaction price. So what's the likelihood that they will trigger discounts or they will take volume and you have to make that assumption now. Then you allocate that transaction price to the obligations. So the complexity here is that you do that based on a standalone price and a fair value. And we've got a good example coming up to illustrate that. And then you recognize the revenue as you go. So you have to determine whether you transfer control at a point in time <coughs> or over time. And you might have both going on for the same contracts, because as we said, we've already unbundled the promises within that contract. So it's just a new way of looking at things. For some businesses, this will be very complex. For other businesses, it won't be, but it is the exercise first. So let's have a look at what we've got going on and how we would account for that. And in some cases, it massively um, accelerates your revenue recognition, and in some cases, it, it doesn't, it prefers it. So it's often a time and thing. So this is the exam question that, I mean, I don't think in this room, like many people have done exams recently, but if you do, <laughs> this is the one you'll be getting. What does a mobile phone contract look like? So 
you would pay £360 up front, £50 a month for three years, you get your iPhone and you get a bundle of unlimited calls, text and data. So that's the contract, pretty easy. So we know you identify the contract, you've got that signed with the customer. We know what we're going to give, we're going to give them a phone and then we're going to give them the package, the, like the line rental, the calls, text and data, that's easy. Where it gets complex is whether you give them a call package and then they can have a bolt on and all of this malarkey. We've kept it quite simple. We know the transaction price, so we know in total what we're going to get from the customer. To allocate the price to the promise, we know that the phone is worth 720. So you've actually charged them 360, they get they feel like they're getting a discount, but the revenue to be recognised is the 720. Because at that point in time, you've given that phone, that's the fair value of that piece of revenue and then the rest of it you would allocate over three years. So it's a really simple example to show if you recognise revenue based on the billing profile compared to the IFRS style model, it actually accelerates revenue recognition quite a bit in this scenario. But um, that's just to give you a flavour, obviously you can get more <coughs> detailed and more simple than that. Leasing, my favourite. So IFRS 16, um, in a nutshell, is eliminating the principle of finance and operating leases. So you're probably comfortable with finance leases, an asset you've got on HP, you would work out what the liability is, what you're on the hook for, what the interest is, normally a car, that goes into liabilities and you capitalise the asset. And then you've got your property lease and that just gets chucked in a note at the back of the accounts of what my commitment is, no one ever reads it, and I just recognise the rent as and when I pay it. So, fairly simple. What IFRS 16 does is get rid of that operating lease concept. So, all leases are treated as finance leases, effectively, apart from a few exceptions. So, all of those property leases, you've got a 25 year lease on your head office, while you're the year, that is going on your balance sheet on day one, at the net present value of those future payments. So how much am I on the hook for over the entire lease? And then we discount that back. So we recognise liabilities for the lease and then we recognise a right to use that leased property, so an asset. So this is where I was saying, I've, mainly with retailers, the huge properties they have, store estates, gyms, restaurant chains, head offices, warehouses, millions and millions and millions would go in onto balance sheet for these properties. That's before you even start looking at your forklifts, your lorries, your vans, your company cars, your IT equipment and all of that sort of thing. So this can have a massive operational impact if you've got a lot of leases because it's going to be probably the most material number on your balance sheet now. And before, when it was just a note at the back, no one even looked at it, even we didn't, did we done it? No one looked at it and now everyone's looking at this number. So yeah, a lot of work around that. If it's a short term lease, under 12 months, you can ignore it. If it's a low value asset, you can ignore it. Low value assets in the international standard are those under $5,000. I don't know why it's in dollars. Um, so it's meaning things like phones, um, IT equipment, tills, anything that would cost less than five grand to buy one of. So it's not intended for cars. And they put examples <laughs> like ships and buildings. I mean, if you could get a building lease under five grand, then you're probably pretty lucky anyway. And there's also a lot of, again, devil in the detail. Is it a lease in the first place? So Cooper Parry in Birmingham, we're in a shared office space. Our landlord could move us to another part of that if they wanted to. That's not a lease because we haven't got right to occupy a specified piece of land. They can move us around within that building and they, if that benefits them, they can do it. That means substantively that is not a lease. So again, you do have to look into the small print of is it even a lease in the first place? And I did have one client when I'm like, have you got any leases? No, we haven't got any. I'm like, I'm sure. We didn't rent stuff though. <laughs> yeah, same thing. So it is interesting to go around the business and make sure you have captured all of your lease agreements in the first place. Now the impact of this, as we said, the liability is the present value of future lease payments. So it's all the payments you're really <laughs> going to make that fixed. Any that are variable and linked to an index. So if it's like market rent increases linked to RPI or whatever that might be. Uh, residual value guarantees and purchase options. So if it's a car and it's got a balloon payment and you know you're likely to make that payment, um, you would factor that in. But equally, if it's a lease and it's got five year break and you know you're likely to exercise that break and there's a penalty for doing it, you would account for that too. 
So you do have to make assumptions about the future and you have to make assumptions if you're going to be extending leases or buying the property at the end or asset at the end or whether you're going to be breaking. Everyone then goes, oh, well, I'm going to break them. But yeah, you have to have like some reasonable assumptions around it and your auditor should be looking at, well, have you ever broken a lease before? What's the long-term strategy? But yeah, the first inclination is everyone wants to just put it in for the lowest amount that they can. So you do that at the cash amount and then we discount back. So when we discount back, this is a dark art in itself. <laughs> and we did a number of projects for our clients um, who are the large retailers who went first on how do you even calculate the discount rate. So the standard says first, you use the interest rate and place it in the lease. I've never seen anyone do that. It is completely impossible. Um, I even do a project with BMP Paribas Real Estate. They don't, they can't do it. No one can do it. Because how can you say if you've got a 10 year lease on a property or even worse, like a floor in a property, what's that worth as a percentage of the entire property that's got land included? And yeah, you just can't get there. No one can get there. You can for cars, because it's easy, everyone knows about your cars, but property you can't. So you then go to incremental borrowing rate, which is, well, what's the company's rate if they were to acquire a similar type of asset, similar security? So basically don't use your overdraft rate for a 20 year lease because the two things aren't compatible. So you use your incremental borrowing rate. We have some challenges recently. I've got some clients that are pretty much on longer rates. So yeah, it has some real complications when you try and do that. And I've also got some clients that have no borrowing whatsoever. So we tend to use guilt. It's not allowed in IFRS, but it's practice to do it. Whereas FRS 102 is giving you these other options of using an obtainable borrowing rate or your guilt rate. But in a nutshell, what do you, what's your borrowing rate? Say it's 6% that's what you'll be discounting. The other side is an asset. So it's a right of use asset that goes into your fixed assets. Um, in terms of analysts and how they look at this, and as an accountant, you see these assets, it's a bit like an intangible asset. It's not, it's not got real substance to it. So um, yeah, we do obviously look at it, but there's probably quite an incentive perhaps to impair these sometimes and how you know if it stores how's the store performing we would often add them back if we do a long concern <coughs> review and that kind of thing you can't get security on it you can't use it as collateral they're just a big number on your balance sheet effectively um, and that's valued as your liability plus any payments you've made in advance plus any incentives the landlord has given you plus all your professional costs stamp duty and all of that and then the last one is a nice little kicker at the end rectification costs so capitalised dilapidations and you need to start looking at that if that's an issue so if you put I don't know, mezzanine in and you've got to take it out at the end that forms part of this for most clients these are individually not material or significant things but you can see how it adds up if you've got lots of them going on record I know you've got a big showroom estate so a lot to be thinking about on some of these so a really, I'm not going through these numbers, these are complex numbers in a minute, but 10 year lease, 150 grand a year, you've got some professional fees of 50k, it's an 8% discount rate, you can say on day one for that lease alone you are putting a liability in of 937,000 and an asset of 1.1 million. So that liability will go into non-current liabilities but you have a current element for the bit you're on the hook for the next year. So you can see immediately your gearing ratios, your current asset ratios will be affected. And then going forwards, that liability gets unwound by what you're paying and then it will wind with the discount factor. So you have an interest charge for your p &L, and the right of use asset gets depreciated and any impairment. So you'll see your EBITDA actually will shoot up. You get a real EBITDA boost from this because you're taking rent out and you're replacing it with depreciation and interest yeah so sure that's it so this one is um i say it could be a real beast depending on how many leases you have how material they are what state your records are in um equally it could be a, a non-issue if you quite a simple business but um the other bit to mention <coughs> is why it's worth preparing is that if you've got a lot to manage then software is generally recommended because not only have you got to track or do these net present value calculations and you saw that formulas and stuff involved in some of them, you then need to get your auditor happy. There's a big tax piece at the minute that the tax is not necessarily aligned with the accounting. So again, a lot of record keeping on it. Your bank covenants, unless they're on a frozen gap basis, will have EBITDA covenants in there or gearing covenants in there, which 
change from this. Um, we saw on one client uh, share options and bonus schemes and incentive schemes are often linked to EBITDA or linked to other performance measures. And again, someone's going to get a great bonus if you don't change some of that and then allow this to come in. So it has some operational impact <coughs> on that side of it. Um, but all the hard work really is in year one. Once it's done, you can then roll this forward and it becomes business as usual very quickly, but don't underestimate how much work it'll be just to get comfortable in the first place. So that's changes to FRS volume two. So you're all stunned into silence now of all the work you've got coming down the line, I'm afraid. And even though I love FRS 16 deep in my heart, I still think it's the wrong thing to bring it in. I honestly do because it's not a great time. We've all got too much work on and it's make sure accounts look crazy. Let's, let's face it. I think Andy's nodding his head because I'm going to ignore it. Well, I, I'm really interested whether you, you call it depreciation or, or for an operating. Yeah. For, but you know, EBITDA will change dramatically, yeah. and that's how we value businesses. So. I know, and I've seen some clients use EBITDA with like an R for rent yeah. on the end. Yeah, we always do that in rental, on yeah. uh, retail businesses, but um, yeah, I think I think it needs another name rather yeah. than depreciation or amortization. Yeah, it does. And then <laughs> the last thing on the leasing one is that when you adopt it, so under IFRS you could go back to year dot or you could do it in year one, like a modified. FS102 just gives you the modified route. That means you don't restate your comparatives. So in year one that you do it, how crazy are your accounts going to look that you've got like, whoa, where's this asset come from? Where's these liabilities come from? Why's my EBITDA massive? Let's look at last year, none of it in there. But at least everyone else will look crazy too. So <laughs> there is that. Um, FS100, this is the one that is niche. So we'll skip over this quickly. But if you are an intermediate parent company in the UK, so you're a UK group, but you're owned by an overseas group, you could take a section, no one quizzing on this, but oh, it isn't there, it's all right. Section 401 exemption to not prepare group accounts in the UK on the principle that you are incorporated into a group somewhere else. But the has to be, I um, can't remember what the word is, but economically equivalent to overseas gap. So it means the accounting standard has to be at least as good as UK gap is the principle of this. So this is a Brexit thing that's dropped out that they've had to change the guidance on what is equivalent to UK GAAP. So they are now saying if the company follows EU adopted IFRS, that's equivalent, or if it's IFRS adopted by the International Standards Board with no change, that's equivalent. And then they've put a list of countries that are deemed equivalent, and some of them are pretty standard. USA, yeah, get it, Canada, yeah, Japan, yeah. And then you think, oh, where's Germany and Sweden and all these countries that are a bastion of financial robustness? They're not on the list. Like, that's a bit of a political thing. But no EU countries are deemed equivalent. So if you're part of an overseas group that reports, say, German Gap or French Gap, I don't know if we've got any of those. No, they are not equivalent. You will be preparing group accounts now in the UK. If you're part of a group incorporated in China, that is equivalent, apparently. <laughs> Korea, yeah, that is. So it's a very strange, oh, I'm going to say slightly political list that just don't get caught out. If you're part of an overseas group and you don't prepare group accounts because you have the exemption, just check you still do. Basically, is the message on that one. I see that's South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You never know, do you? You never know. I think it is that correct. Um, I don't think we have any Korean-based companies, but I check that sanctions list. Uh, FRS, I'm sorry, FRC, Financial Reporting Council's review into what we all do wrong. Um, this, every year they review about 250 to 300 sets of accounts, mainly listed companies. Their comment this year was that quality was maintained. I don't know if that's good quality or bad quality, but it's been maintained. Uh, but interestingly, 10% of the companies they looked at had to restate their accounts following their review. So that's not a great track record, is it? Especially when they're listed. So that was the outcome, but the findings, so this is what they are looking for, so therefore this trickles down to what us as auditors are looking for, is um, these are the areas that they found the most problems on. So cash flows, financial instruments, yeah, I mean, they're hard, aren't they? So fair enough, you know, very hard to get right. Um, income taxes, the issue on that is they want more um, explanation of if you're loss making and recognising deferred tax assets, they want a lot more explanation as to why strategic reports so they've reminded everybody that 
that should be fair and balanced. It should talk about the positives and the negatives of performance um, position and what's going on um, with due balance, measured, no undue kind of positivity in there. I mean, it's been written by the people who run the business, so naturally we'll get a little bit, yeah, put a bit of spin on it, but no, the reminding is that it should be an unbalanced assessment. I don't think I've ever read one that is, but that's what that is. Revenue, um, judgments, presentation, all of those points basically saying they want a lot more detail. They've got a bee in their bonnet that all the accounting policies <coughs> are boilerplate, they're taken on the standard. They want them all to be a lot more entity specific, a lot more detailed. Um, they come up multiple times. <coughs> Provisions are saying again, they want a lot more detail. What is the provision? How likely is it you're going to have to pay this out? What period are you going to have to pay it out over? The APMs, alternative performance measures, they bang on about this all the time. This is saying don't give undue prominence to like EBITDA and non underlying, <laughs> non core. You need to always frame them back to the standard statutory measures and explain what measures you're using. And then impairment of assets. They're just saying with climate change and COVID and the war, we're expecting a lot more impairments. We're not necessarily seeing them. Please can you talk more about the estimates and judgments and assumptions you're making to make your assessment of asset impairments. Last bit then, economic crime bill. As I said, this sounds really interesting. Um, it's not, sadly. Uh, it's about company's house reform. So background here is, it is part of a wider issue in the UK that over the years we've had simplification of a lot of our reporting regimes. So you might have thought a few years ago, I did that lovely annual return, told everyone who all the shareholders were and who owned the company and the directors had to put their home address on. And since then, the government got rid of all that. We don't need an annual return. Just do a confirmation statement and tell us who your beneficial owners are. And no one ever fills that in properly. And the directors can just put the company address on. And then we had the Russia-Ukraine war and they're like, no, we need to get rid of all these Russian businesses. Uh, can't actually find out who owns anything in the UK. Uh, so this led to the economic crime bill. So fast tracking uh, these reforms to basically get more transparency <coughs> into who owns and controls what assets in the UK to allow the other law enforcement agencies to do their work. So <coughs> that's where this is kind of coming from. Um, so part of it is, like we say, the sanctions regime. We talked about that quite a lot in the last session. And this register of overseas entities. But the bits coming up now we're going to talk around is just the company's house reforms. The other bits are quite niche, won't affect you immediately. I don't really know what the crypto asset bit is, so we'll have to do that. Um, but company's house reform, how they're contributing to this. So the first one is simplified accounts filing. This is going to have massive kind of implications because currently if you are a small company, you don't have to file your P&L. So you take that out, you fill it, it you abridge them. I mean, personally, I can never remember what gets filled out or in, so it makes it easier for me at least, but commercially, all these small companies now have to publish what they prepare. So before we had it where you didn't put, years ago, was you didn't put turnover, did you? Start at the gross margin. No, the whole lot has to go in now. So they getting away from simplified accounts filing, you will file the lot, including your P&L, including the director's report for all companies. And basically because that makes it easier for companies' house to then see if someone was eligible for the exemption in the first place, because you could only take this stuff out if you were under on turnover, but you took out the page that told them the turnover, so it wasn't easy to enforce. Um, there's a piece about anti-avoidance. This doesn't really change anything. This is just saying that if you are a dormant company or you're audit exempt, you have to make a statement to why you are dormant or why you are audit exempt. That's kind of in there already, so I don't think that's anything new. They're probably just changing how they do it. This is where you're all going to have to get very comfortable with the Companies Act and start quoting under Section 406.A on this and that. So that's what that's referring to. The last one on this one, anti-avoidance, is the one that was like a blow to my heart because there's a little known loophole in Companies House that you can only extend your accounting period every five years, but you can shorten it as much as you like. And if you shorten it by one day, the day before your filing deadline, it automatically triggers another three months to file. So if you've not done it already, this window is closing to do it. Because sometimes, you know, cash flow and going concern and COVID and staff shortages, you need every minute you can to file. Nine months is just not enough. Um, mm. They're getting rid. They're getting rid of that. They're wise to it. So soon you will only be able to shorten your accounting period 
every five years the same as you can extend it. And then the last thing is anyone filing at Crunkies House or the directors or the people filing the information will need to have ID checks. I think it's going to be the same as the tax system where they want your passport and your driving license. If anyone's done their tax recently, it's like, is this your mortgage payment? Is this your broadband bill? It's that kind of level of ID checks that are joined up with the tax regime. Again, it's to make sure that when you say Mr. Bloggs is the director, it actually is him and he's not a front for someone else. And that's the that's the kind of what that's aimed at. And then the last bit again, which strikes fear of God into me, is that companies house have more powers to check and remove and decline information. So every now and again, you get Keen Bean who will reject <coughs> your account saying that you've missed a full stop on note 28. And yeah, they're extending their powers to do that. So yeah, look out for that one. Let's see how that plays out. That, that's it from me. So yeah, Q and A.